Hi, sorry, I have two questions. Sure. One is um, sugar reduction or elimination uh -huh. I've been trying to do, and it's great, but sometimes it's difficult, sweet tooth, that's our deal. Sure. I've read conflicting reports on whether maple syrup and honey naturally occurring organic can be used as a substitute because they both have antioxidants, um, but I'm wondering what your view is on that. Yeah, I would still classify uh, maple syrup and honey as a sugar, but that wouldn't mean I would say you have to completely eliminate it. Okay. I think um, it's really seeing what you tolerate too, um, and in, in maybe small amounts, you know. So start with a, a teaspoon if you want a teaspoon of your honey, or you want to try to make a sweet treat with, you know, like I'll take a recipe maybe that has maple syrup and honey and say, oh, I wonder if I could try to make this and cut, cut that amount in half. Sure. You know, so still reducing it, but I do think if you are going to be using sugar, those are some of the best forms. And then kind of in along the lines of that, fruit. Uh, I noticed that there wasn't a lot of conversation around fruit in this, sure. and I'm curious about that as well. Fruit intake, um, I think it's really individual. Um, sometimes some of my patients can do okay with fruit and some people don't. Um, I think fruit in moderation is probably what I would recommend for most people, probably like two to four servings of fruit a day. Um, and going from there. More so, I see it cause some more GI issues in some of my patients, too, um, versus I wouldn't necessarily call fruit inflammatory, though. Yeah, there was a few, a lot of the anti-inflammatory diets I looked at recommended, like, berries specifically. Yeah, so. definitely. I think berries are some of the healthiest fruits we can do. So, okay. yeah, like I said, I never want to over-restrict people's diets, but I wouldn't say, it, you know, these people that are eating, you know, just fruit, like for lunch and just high quantities of fruit probably, you know, wouldn't be recommended. Good question. Any other questions? Sure. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you had any information just regarding moderation or elimination of either caffeine, either caffeine or alcohol as far as inflammation. Sure. Good questions. Um, so alcohol um, definitely is known to be inflammatory. I didn't include it because it's not m maybe research-based, but it can be, especially to the gut, gut health, and um, it can be inflammatory, so we would want to kind of watch intake of that. You know, I, you know, if you are drinking, we say for women, no more than one drink at a time, men, no more than two drinks. So, and then I think, like I said, um, the more you clean up your diet, you're going to see how you, your body reacts individually to some of these things. And you might find, oh, you do okay, but you can do white wine. You, you do better with white wine but, or vodka, but you may not do good with beer. You know, so it's kind of learning um, that. And what was the second thing? The second? Caffeine. That's right. Yeah. Um, caffeine. Um, not necessarily inflammatory, but some of my patients just don't do well with caffeine. But... I don't restrict it to begin with. Um, we might just have to lim limit the caffeine and then just see, just some people just start feeling better with, without it. So, but it's nothing I start with restricting. So I, I personally think most people probably are okay as long as it's not excessive. It's just something like a, a cup of coffee a day or something. Um, probably should be okay. Yes? Thank you for the presentation. That uh, was great. Um, you're welcome. Uh, a comment and a question, just a comment that uh, I was one of the people at the ASIF meeting in China. There's no fat people there. They don't have sugars. You know, for dessert they have a red bean paste or a black uh, bean soup or something. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, interesting. Um, I'm surprised you never mentioned turmeric, which many people regard as the magic cure also. Yeah. Your I, comments, please. Yes. The turmeric um, is interesting. The problem, I almost included it, but the problem is there's not enough research to back it up. So the research out there is not conclusive on turmeric, but, um, you know, there's turmeric supplements. There's different ways to get turmeric in your diet. Some people do, do feel that is very anti-inflammatory. Uh, so I think using turmeric could be a good thing. It's just, it's not totally solidified out there about the, uh, the conclusive on the research. So. Yes. Hi. Hi. I'm still confused. This is specifically for AS, yeah. which is, does the disease cause the deterioration of the joint, which creates inflammation, or does the inflammation attack the joints, which creates the deterioration? Yeah. So I'm kind of back to the chicken and the egg. Right. You know, does this do that or does that do this? Which seems like an important place to begin 
in understanding how to move forward. Yeah, and I was hoping that someone might help me understand that. I'm not sure if I'm the best person to, to answer that question, unfortunately. I will tell you that um, a lot of these chronic diseases, where it be AS or um, you know, rheumatoid arthritis or cancers, mm -hmm. we all are finding that there's inflammation. You know, inflammation is involved in, in these diseases. Well, inflammation, yes, is definitely involved, but you know, how do you go about it? And as I said, you know, which comes first? Yeah. And so how do you approach it? And how do you approach it? You know, it? it seems like that dealing with the inflammation, regardless of whether it's uh, the chicken or the egg, Correct. seems like a good idea. Sure. But does it actually um, deter the progression of the disease? Yeah, I don't know if I can say for sure. I'm sure it's, uh, you know, inflammation is a result of the disease, is what I would say. You would say that it's a result of disease? I would say, but again, I'd probably want one of the doctors to, to answer <laughs> that question other than me. Um, okay. And all of these things can help decrease the inflammation, so hopefully can help, help decrease symptoms as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. That was very informative. Oh, thank um, you. Question. You mentioned the importance of deep colored vegetables. So when you roast them, mm -hmm. oftentimes what you see on TV and you know the food shows, basically whatever the vegetables are, they end up turning very dark or very brown. Mm -hmm. Do they still retain the same nutritional value? They do retain their nutritional val value. Um, it's a little controversial as far as to, is the raw vegetables the best for us. And they probably do retain a little bit more nutrition, but I wouldn't, you know, I'm not proposing everybody eat raw foods or, or not cook their, you know, cook their vegetables. I think just getting people to eat that quantity of vegetables, the eight to nine cups, and, and getting all that nutrition and enjoying cooked vegetables is going to be okay. The, the, the quality might be a little bit lower than a raw vegetable, but I still think you're going to get it. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Hi. I loved your presentation. Oh, thank you. Um, my question um, was more about, so a lot of these people are on um, immune suppressors. Like my husband's on Humira right now. Sure. And one thing that I really worry about this time of year is with flu season and everything and him having an immune system that is unfortunately being a little compromised by this. Sure. Um, what you'd recommend, I mean, from a food standpoint, um, helping to protect him a little more um, in regards to immunity because I've also read that people with autoimmune diseases may have, you know, the opposite effect to something that would normally help um, someone mm -hmm. without an immune disease. Yeah, I think um, the vegetables that we talked about have so much nutrition. Vitamin C and zinc are really good for the immune system too. So foods high in vitamin C are going to be your citrus fruits as well as like your peppers. Um, and then there's also talk about maybe considering a supplement too that does have some vitamin C and zinc in it. Um, might be also helpful. Thank you. Sure. Hi, so we have a Hi. question from Jim on Facebook. Okay. Uh, you covered some of his question, but he wants to know a little bit more specifically on the section that you talked about, omega-6, uh -huh. uh, specifically avocados, which are heavy in omega-6, um, as well as whole grains versus processed grains. Yeah, so the, the avocados I still do recommend, and in regard to the whole grains versus processed grains, um, if you are going to eat a grain, I would definitely rather it be a whole grain. Um, so oatmeal, whole wheat, you know, those are going to be whole grains versus all the processed ones that we talked about. Then the question just becomes in, well, what about gluten? You know, so um, are they sensitive to gluten? There are some gluten-free whole grains out there as well, such as tev, millet, and sorghum are some whole, and oats, gluten-free oats that are kind of grown separately and not contaminated with gluten. Those can be some whole grains um, that are also gluten-free if somebody is sensitive to gluten. Any other questions? Any other questions? Oh. Uh, the gluten-free ones. Um, so it was sorghum, taff, the gluten-free goat, um, gluten-free oats, millet. Yeah. I do have a handout for you as well. Um, it's 
back after you fill out or after you turn in your evaluations, it's back back there, right? Um, so that it has just kind of summarized what I talked about today. It also does have information um, about my nutrition and wellness consulting company called uh, Revival Wellness, where I do video visits if anybody was interested in something like that. Um, so that should be back there along with my business cards. You'll get the handout once you turn in the evaluation. So thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. We have one more oh, question. Oh, one more question. Yes. Sorry, one more question. Um, so I've done a lot of research for nutrition as well. I, I'm very excited about the implication of that in treating autoimmune. Yeah. One thing is that has come up a lot and it's become very, very fatty. Yeah. And I'm just very interested in what your input you have is intermittent fasting. Yes. And, and uh, calorie restrictive diets. Yeah. So what role do you think that plays along with everything else you've talked about? Does it have you, whether it's anecdotal or any research base? Yeah, I think it's very interesting. The whole intermittent fasting is really becoming more popular and we are starting to, to get some research. So um, the idea is that if you go longer periods without food, that that gives your body and your cells kind of more time to regenerate and that this is gonna have a positive effect on people with autoimmune disease. So. Um, yeah, I think it's working with a practitioner who's used it and, and trying it, um, I think is, is great. And I don't think we have the research out there specifically for autoimmune disease, but I think it'll come. And you know, some of the, the basics I start with, and I use this for weight loss too, is just getting people to eat in a short, shortened time period is, is one of the beginning steps to, to the intermittent fasting. So maybe eating during an eight hour time span. So maybe eating between the hours of you know, 12 and 8 p.m. to start with and do that for a few days and, and just to see. A lot of people do notice that they just feel better. I've seen improvements with weight loss. Some of my GI um, patients that are having a lot of GI issues notice improvements with GI health. So. Um, I think it's going to be in the future. For sure, we're going to be hearing more about that, and I, I'm very intrigued by it as well. Yeah.